times they're assuming Western education. For instance, it was Western and alien to my mother and my grandmother mm. to be educated in science, in geography, mm. in history, in logic, mm. in physics, you know, go on. Just the curriculum as you get it in, in school. And often I would hear my parents discuss with one another, send my children to school, my, mo my father would say to my mother, keep them in school. And my mother would say, but then they will get detached from our clan and from our religion, and she would try to educate us in something else. So Westerners assume when they say education, what they really mean is Western education. And non-Westerners know that. Mm -hmm. And it's the response to that. And non-Westerners sometimes encourage their children to get Western education, and they do that consciously. And some of them are able to give them a, f a bit of their old traditional identity that doesn't interfere with that Western curriculum. Some of them reject it altogether. My mother rejected it altogether, deep in her heart. She told my father, if you send my, your daughters to school and you keep them in school, they're going to talk back to you. They're going to be rebellious. They're going to do things that you don't want them to do. And she was completely right. Education, Western education, made me rebellious, made me talk back, made me run away, made me lead my own life. So it's very important for us when we talk about education to identify which type of education and which type of education do we encourage. And the education system that I've come to encourage is that Western form of education. It's interesting the roles played by your parents because most cases, but not always, you will have mothers who want to see their daughters educated uh, fully and to be able to advance themselves and have vocational opportunities and make choices for themselves. And at times we've witnessed in certain societies where usually the father uh, hasn't always been that forthcoming. But you are mentioning that in your case, your father was encouraging an educational path. A Western education. A Western educational path. But uh, your mother was concerned about what that would do. She was concerned, and her concern was, if you educate your children Western style, they'll become like Westerners mm -hmm. and move away from our traditions and from our... Uh, from our religion, and she was right in that. Now, the, not all Muslim women are like my mother. Not lo all Muslim families are like uh, my family. Some of them somehow find a reconciliation between giving their children a Western education and at the same time keeping them within the clan loyalties and within the Islamic religious loyalties. That is a small group. Uh, what I have noticed, especially when it comes to the big question in Europe, of assimilating Muslim minorities into Dutch society, French society, British society, where the leadership of these societies are talking about Western education, mm -hmm. that that reconciliation is not something that you should be taken for granted. It is a very difficult transition that many immigrants either do not know how to go about it, or even if they know how to go about it, reject Western education, and somehow just cannot find a balance between the two. And that is what I find interesting. And I think my life and the story of my life um, illustrates those transitional differences. And in Nomad, I try to explain that because individuals are very different, I made the transition. My sister almost made it and then didn't. Mm. My brother, who was really very good in school uh, when we were in Somalia, in Saudi Arabia, in Ethiopia, in Kenya, uh, he would get the admiration of his teachers and everyone around him in how he performed academically, that is in the Western education that he was getting. But somehow he didn't make it. As he grew older and matured, he got lost in that hiatus, in that gap between the two cultures. Um, I come across other people who have made it. I mean, in Washington alone, I come, uh, I meet many people from the Muslim world uh, who have made it and are stars. I mean, Fuad Ajami, a man I admire a lot, 
uh, Farid Zakaria. There are some very famous names in the United States who did make that transition. I only tell in Nomad my story about how I think that I made it, but also why I think it is difficult for the mainstream to cross that bridge. You also talk about in the book not only the importance of Western education, but you also talk about this uh, concept of integration and transition. And three elements that you identify as being very important, you talk about responsibility, duty, and critical thinking. Talk a bit about that. Why is that very instructive? for others who may be pursuing a nomadic life and can look to your example in terms of the kinds of transitions that you have made? Um, when I came to the West, I realized that words such as responsibility, where I come from, it is responsibility to the clan, responsibility to God, responsibility to the group and to the family. In the West, it was ingrained responsibility in yourself as an individual. You, are, you, you were brought up, at least by most Western families, that seemed to be the general idea. You as an individual find your own path in life and responsibility to others means not bringing them harm. Where I come from, responsibility means not giving up on the habits and rituals and convictions that the clan gives to you and passing them on to the next generation. Duty means duty to your parents. Mm -hmm. uh, as a child, you are almost an insurance policy for your parents because when they grow old, you take care of them. When I was in Holland, and we talked about, I first learned the word insurance. It meant that you made your own money and you saved it and you took care of your old age and your parents didn't depend on you. They depended on themselves you pay taxes, you, they save pensions, etc. that kind of system. But to be financially responsible in that way, you have to become literate mm -hmm. in the modern way of going about money. And sometimes it involved shedding your duties and your responsibilities and your sense of guilt toward your parents who, like one of the cousins that I discuss in the book, uh, every time he makes a penny, a dollar, he sends three quarters of it to his father. And his father uses that money to marry more wives, to have more children, because that, according to his father, that's how wealth is defined. And I worry about my poor cousin because I think he's not saving any money, he has no pensions, he's worked all this time in his life, and he's going to depend on welfare. And many, many Europeans with whom I have had discussions about how to eliminate or at least reduce poverty among immigrants somehow overlook this mechanism and look for it in other factors such as the discrimination of society against Muslim immigrants. Muslims feel persecuted and discriminated against. But I think these are external factors, the more internal factors, the decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day life and what inspires them. I think that's what we need to talk about and that is the message of nomad and not only regarding money but also regarding aggression regarding sexuality, and especially sexuality, because that is important in the position of women, in improving the position of women. And if the position of women is improved, I think a great deal of poverty will be relieved, not only for immigrants in Europe and America, but for any, all poor people worldwide. You also discuss in the book uh, that there are three barriers to in integration, and one of them is the treatment of women. Let's discuss that. What does that mean exactly and what did you have in mind in terms of the specific uh, treatment of women? The treatment of women is related to the theme that we just discussed, sexuality. Okay. Uh, in clan, devout Islamic tribal life, the female is considered to be uh, at her best a mother and a wife. Other than that, she is a risky business. The honor of the family lies on her behavior, and especially on her sexual behavior. And in a collective, people gossip about one another. People are jealous of one another. And the way a woman behaves c can be the subject of gossip. And in a society, 
governed by honor and shame, her behavior that is considered deviant can lead the clan's honor, the family's honor, her brother's honor, um, to be to be smeared, reduced, violated. The way to deal with it is to ensure that she is a virgin before her wedding night and as soon as she's married that she's faithful. So th the education that a girl gets from a very young age is to be very chaste, stay at home, be obedient and guard her virginity. When she's married to be obedient and serving and submissive to her husband. That is enforced in different ways by different families. Some families like mine, like my grandmother, ensure that you undergo female genital mutilation and you are covered or you stay at home. It's preached over and over to you what could happen to you if you were to violate the honor of the family. In places like Saudi Arabia, the entire society is segregated into male, the male side and the female side, including the house, including the home. Uh, women are covered up, they are denied uh, to go outside the houses without uh, chaperones. Um, the situation in Saudi Arabia, I think most Americans are familiar with, I don't have to describe that. Now, in coming to Holland, the problems that Westerners like the Dutch and the British and the Americans are confronted with uh, Muslim families trying to enforce that vision of the position of women here in the United States where women have radically different rights and are considered to be equal to their male counterparts and are considered to be able at adulthood to choose their own lifestyles, make their own money and have access to education and in fact it is considered to be something great and positive to encourage women to take part in uh, the workforce, etc. And there you have a collision, there you have a clash of civilizations. How do you value the female? How do you value the relationship between men and women? What governs that? And that values, I can't think of anything where the West and Islamic countries are more different in their outlook than the way women are valued and their contribution to society. How does one deal with that? You mentioned Samuel Huntington. He was my professor at Harvard. And his, uh, his writings on the clash of civilization you have referenced and you do subscribe to. But now, how does one deal with it? Is there a type of uh, uh, series of actions or steps that could be taken to deal with that? I would start with a series of assumptions. And one assumption would be, if you compare the two value systems regarding women, the West and the Islamic, which one do you consider better? If you assume, I do, that the Western value system regarding women is better, then we are con con uh, confronted with the next step, which is, do you preserve or allow these communities to preserve their ways regarding women, or do you refuse to accept that? And I think Professor Samuel Huntington would say, on American soil, I don't think he would propose changing them elsewhere, but on American soil, on Western soil, I think he would say we, we should not practice relativism there. We should protect the rights of all individuals, regardless of their heritage, on American soil. That entails a policy that protects the victims of Islamic culture, female Islamic culture, and the punishment of the perpetrators, but also a sustained education in Muslim men and women to give up their attitudes toward women and their practices and their habits and to adopt new ones. Where does the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, fit into this? Because that provides a standard for all men and women and the protection of human rights. Uh, isn't that and shouldn't that be a factor in all societies, not just one? It is a factor for all societies, but it is an ideal. In some places, that ideal has been preached. I think the United States is one of them. I don't think it's perfect and perfectly round, but I think most of what is in the Declaration of Universal Declaration of Human Rights ha is actually implemented in the West. It is not in the rest of the world. 
one can say we are going to campaign as Westerners outside of the West for these universal rights. And that